episode of Not Alone contains a personal story of mental health. If you or someone you know needs support, visit beyondblue.org.au or call our support service on 1300 22 4636. Hey there, my name is Mark Fennell and welcome to Not Alone, a podcast from Beyond Blue. Remarkable stories from everyday Australians talking about their mental health journey to help you with yours. And this episode is about dealing with that inner critic in your head. Why am I not good enough? My inner critic is never quiet. I'm worried I won't live up to the expectations I place on myself. If I'm relaxing, lazy. I just constantly feel useless, irrelevant and ugly. If I'm being shown care, you don't deserve it. I looked in the mirror this morning and I am so disgusted by myself. If I'm trying, you're useless. My own head and thoughts are worse than what anyone else could ever throw at me. I can't stop comparing myself to my friends. My inner critic always puts me up. When I start to feel happy, can I talk about I feel like a I fraud. I feel like a fraud. I feel like a fraud. I feel like a fraud. I felt so much shame and guilt for who I was and I just couldn't see a future for myself anymore. And just holding on to that intensity of shame around my sexuality, around my body, it wasn't a nice experience. It took me to a really bad place. The concept of our inner voice has been with us a very long time. Uh, you might have heard it described maybe in a different way, like a stream of consciousness or an internal monologue. I particularly like the TV trope of a little angel or a little devil whispering into a character's ear. Whatever the interpretation, this inner voice is actually quite an important part of our ability to process information and actually also make decisions. However, when it becomes critical, when that voice starts to point out every shortcoming, no matter how small, that's when it can start doing more harm than good. And while this inner critic can impact on anyone, the Beyond Blue online forums highlight a particularly susceptible demographic, and that is young women in their teenage years. And that brings us to Amy. When Amy was a teenager, she lived in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne with her parents and her slightly older brother, only slightly. And from an early age, Amy, or Ames as she prefers to be called, she was this bubbly, friendly kid. I was always a very like smiley, happy-go-lucky kind of person, bouncing off the walls, enthusiastic <laughs> about life and everything. Uh, yeah, I was, I was kind of always the comedian of the group with friends and the one that was always dancing around, having a good time. Yeah. yeah. So when did you first realise you were interested in performing? You had that instinct. Oh, well, I started when I was three doing dance classes and I loved it then. I went through stages where I stopped liking it, but then... Seeing as I grew up doing it, it really felt like, this is me, this is what I'm going to do, this is my thing. Right, because there's a thing that happens where it's not just a thing you do, it starts to become like... Your identity. Exactly, yeah. right? Mm. And how, how old were you when you worked that out, that performing was, was who Ames was? I'd say when I was young, because that having grown up in it, it kind of gradually happened as I grew up. And in my family, particularly, everyone else was more... I don't know what the word is, but the opposite of like creative in that sense in things. And I was the creative one, so that's naturally the lane way I took. Made you feel special. Yes. <laughs> How do you feel about the term drama queen? Do you think it would have applied to you as a as a teenager? I was definitely called a drama kid a lot. Drama queen, drama yep. kid, both growing up. At first it was kinda like, oh whatever. And then when I actually started to have things in my life that I was sensitive about, it definitely became more of a triggering word because it felt like my emotions and everything were being dismissed and put under the umbrella of being just dramatic and everything. Amy graduated from being a bubbly kid to being a bubbly teenager. Her big love though was always performing, particularly in the annual school musical, which she was always, like always cast in. But still, like a lot of teenagers, Amy experienced angst around where she fit in at school, and she had this increasingly intrusive inner critic. What was your inner critic saying in those early days? Well, I think it was more just starting to question where I belonged and who I was in school, which is like a natural thing to happen as you're growing up and figuring out who you are. Despite all these feelings, she still had that musical, though, to fall back on. And then, at this crucial teenage stage of identity formation, 
The idea that Amy had of herself, it took a massive hit. So all through school, it felt like a given that I got into everything, because from year seven I, I did, really. Mm. And when it got to the auditions for the senior school musical, that was the first time that I didn't get into something. Take me back to that moment. When did you discover that you didn't get in? Oh, it's that like real public shaming of you're looking for your name on the list, like in a very public place and your name's not there and you're like, <laughs> there's something wrong with this. <laughs> Were there other people around? Oh Were yeah, like, yeah. Were other people shocked as well? Yeah, for me, yes, they were. Because when you're known as being a performing arts person at school, that's what you're known for. And You really strive for an identity at school. You want to be known as the person that does inserts in here. Yeah. I was like, I'm crap at everything. I can't, I don't know how to dance or sing or perform. It just kind of started this inner dialogue of harshness towards myself and questioning what others thought of me. I came to realise I had placed my whole identity in the performing arts and not getting in made me not only question who I was, but what I was going to do. Mm. And there's a sense of humiliation that's accompanied by other people's expectations of you getting in as well. And then the disappointment and awkwardness felt when it doesn't happen. This was all at the end of year nine. And so after the summer holidays, Amy transitioned into senior school where new students were welcomed into year 10. And of course that caused a bit of reshuffling of the social order of friendship groups. And Amy found herself even more uncertain of where she fit in. What does it look like to not know where you belong in a, in a school? Uh, it's like the old term, like being a floater. Like you just kind of uh, awkwardly float around the groups, not really knowing who, where you're welcome or what you're doing. Like occasionally there'd be another person who was awkwardly flo floating trying to figure themselves out, so you kind of... Attach? <laughs> yeah, you'd hang out and it'd be a good time. Other times just weigh in with other groups a little bit. To be honest, it's a pretty blurry memory of that time. I just remember being... feeling like... I kind of left the security of the group that I did have because I didn't feel... like I felt like I didn't fit in there anymore. Mm. And from there it was just like trying to get through the day. And while she was unsure of which peers to spend time with and turn into proper friends, Amy's inner critic was there, always up for hanging out. Just walk me through what that dialogue was like Be before things got bad. Like, how would it manifest? How did you know it was there? Well, that's the thing. I didn't know it was there. I didn't, I didn't think, I didn't have a conscious awareness of it or what it was. I just started to have myself against myself mm. and just, any scenario that was happening there was a, a bad thought about it so say it's you're walking into school it's like everyone's looking at you everyone's looking at you. you look gross you look gross <laughs> like you're disgusting you're why disgusting. like what are you doing do you think anybody else realized that you had this whole inner conversation going on um upon reflection my best friend was highly aware that i was in, I, at some stage i just lost myself i got warped into my own brain a bit and Amy disappeared in a way, but otherwise people didn't really notice. Was there a defined point when that inner criticism got worse? Yeah, definitely. So what happened? I would grapple onto connection through romance with boys and it's just kind of that classic maladaptive behaviour for when you can't quite deal with what's going on internally, so you, you distract yourself with anything that you can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for me, a big part of that was the excitement of and the flirtation of connecting with someone. And there was one particular guy that I really became quite infatuated with, and just having that kind of love interest made getting to school doable, like made it okay. I trusted him way more than I should have <laughs> and yeah he took a, a photo of me without my knowing or without my consent in any way a private photo and then he shared it with all his friends and all of a sudden I had had my power taken away from me completely despite the impact these events had on Amy she still didn't tell the school or her parents she was filled with the sense of shame and guilt, as if she was responsible, as if she, through the natural, 
expression of her personality was at fault. It was like evidence for my inner critic to just go haywire and just be like, you're a bad person, you're, you're a, a slut, person, you're everyone a slut, knows you're about you, why are you here, what are you doing, why are you here, what are you doing, you have no credibility as a decent human being and you're never going to be able to live this down, ever. Did the conversation you have in your head, did it, did it get worse, did it get better from that point? Oh, it definitely got worse, yeah. So how does it go, I mean, what you were describing before sounds pretty oppressive, how does it get worse from there? Um, well, it got to the point where it was crippling. I couldn't go into school school anymore. Like, internal started manifesting externally. I couldn't bring myself to get out of the car to go into school because I couldn't face seeing other people thinking I knew what they were thinking about me. Like, a warped way to describe it, but just feeling so much shame. I couldn't concentrate on anything else other than everything that was going on in my in my head. I couldn't walk into a classroom without being unreasonably terrified that there wouldn't be a seat for me and then I'd, my hands would be shaking but I was icy cold and simultaneously sweaty. I don't know, there was so much, so much happening at once and then once I finally got in there I couldn't stop thinking of what other people were thinking about me which was really just a reflection of my fears of what I thought everyone was thinking about me. So it was not a nice headspace to be in. So I couldn't concentrate on anything that was happening because I was in my whole world, in my head, and just trying to get through each moment, feeling like I couldn't breathe and I couldn't talk. Like if I was asked a question, I wouldn't be able to make words come out of my mouth. Had you spoken to anybody about what was going on in your head, how you were feeling about all of this stuff that was swirling around you? I'd talked to a friend a bit, but mostly <coughs> I just kind of kept it in because having been called a drama queen, I was like, if I say anything, then I'm, I'm a drama queen. With the encouragement of this friend, Amy sought out professional help. She saw the school counsellor as well as a psychiatrist. But even in those sessions, she was reluctant to open up about what was really going on deep down. And as a result, she was diagnosed with minor anxiety. Can you remember the, the first day you just decided, I'm not going to school? I didn't feel like I ever got to decide. It was being driven into school and having this battle with my own brain about you can go in, you can do this, it's going to be fine. And then getting to school and just feeling like I was, my body was made or filled with cement and I was glued to the seat. And no matter how much someone tried to push me to get out there and go into school, it wasn't even an option for me. For the best part of a term, Amy's parents would drive her up to the school gate, only for Amy to plead to be driven straight back home again. But she wasn't sharing any of why she didn't want to go to school with either of her parents. And so it started to cause these tensions at home. They're just like, you need to go to school, go to school. And I'm going, nope. <laughs> but that's the thing, I was so closed off to it because I didn't understand what was happening to me. So there's no way that I could put into an explanation of I'm feeling like this and therefore I cannot go into school I was just like no nope, not doing it not going nope no way and they're like nope. you need to go you're not giving us any reason why you couldn't go so can you just go <laughs> were they confused and annoyed like they were very annoyed I think more so because not only do they want me to get into school but they can obviously see that something's not right and they I wasn't giving them the ability to access that I wasn't letting that come out Amy says that as things got progressively worse, her family remained intensely worried about her. She often got the feeling that they were ready to intervene and take control, but for now, they were just tired of fighting and stopped trying to force her to go to school each day. Once free from school, Amy thought she had escaped her problems, but soon found that they just followed her home. She took to spending long stretches of time in her room, unable to catch a break, from that inner critic. It took a different kind of turn in that it became more really shifted to body image for me and around food and everything. And that was because if you can change the narrative of how people are talking about you to how you look, like if people are gonna talk about you, change the narrative to be about something else kind of thing. I think that's, in a sense, was where the control came in. It's like, I can control how they look at me. So I became 
very obsessed with hygiene and food. Fear of gaining weight. I, at the time, I was like, why am I sort of... Had to wash my hands excessively. Like, so even during a meal, I would get up to wash my hands. Stuck eating to the point that I hardly ate anything at all. Like, you could ever feel like excited about anything. I couldn't again. touch anything. You just stuck. And then I'd exercise a lot. Like, I'd have one routine thing I did, and then I'd go to the next, and then I'd also go to the gym, then I'd go for a walk, I'd do weights, I'd do everything. It just was non-stop, this routine. And even the thought of having to miss exercise for a day was... It would send me into a complete meltdown, and I'd just be crying fits on the floor like a two-year-old at the supermarket who really wanted some lollies but wasn't getting any. It was like that. Well, I was doing my usual workout and I was in so much pain. My muscles were hurting so much because I was exercising too much. And I was kind of just, I was crying through it and just trying to keep going because m my brain was completely split. Like in one side of my head, I was being told that you have to keep doing this to, for everything to be okay and to keep going, you have to do this. Otherwise your whole world will be over. And then there was this other side of me that was just so scared and had in moments actually seen how I looked and what I was doing to myself and was like this isn't right this isn't okay like the pain that I was feeling kind of gave a bit of rationality to that voice that was really scared you know that old saying about horses in water it could very equally be applied to mental health and therapy no matter how in need someone is of help and support, you just can't force them to go if they don't want to be there. After nearly a year of being at home, being locked in a seemingly endless battle with her inner critic, for Amy, the time had come. With her exercise gear still on, her muscles and joints racked with pain caused by her excessive exercise, she went to her dad. She told him she needed help. So yeah, I saw my doctor that day and she said to me something I'll never forget. She said, I know you feel like this is the worst day of your life, but I promise you it'll be one of the best because today's the day that you're turning things around. And it literally clicked in my head at that moment. And I just felt this immense relief as I realized, holy shit, you're sick. This isn't you. This is something you actually need help with. From that moment, I was kind of, I became down to get better. I was like, I'm down for recovery. Let's do this. 100% the name of your memoir, but you carry on. <laughs> down to recover. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so that was a big component of it that I was like, yes, I want to do this, but I want to do it right. So with the help of Amy's GP and her family, they put together what would affectionately come to be known as the A-team. With her GP in the lead role, the rest of the team consisted of a psychiatrist, a dietitian, the school counsellor, and a yoga instructor. Ultimately, it was all people who really aligned with my values and it took a lot of time to find the right people because mm. I was very picky about it, but I think that's actually a really important thing that you can't just expect it to be the first person you sit down and see. Like, some people are like, oh, therapy doesn't work. It's like, because you have got to find the right person sometimes. Mm. At least that's what I feel. But health professionals aside, like, mum and dad and my brother played a really, really big role in it because we made that choice well, ultimately, my doctor more instigated saying, I'd rather you be an outpatient than an inpatient because I think it's going to be better for you mentally. Mm. So home kind of became my hospital in a way. And mum and dad and my brother all were continuously working to help get me to a better headspace because I was really grappling with what's a rational thought, what's not a rational thought. And now I was starting to feel comfortable to talk about it so it was putting that out on the table and having them help guide me towards understanding that <laughs> did you get a new diagnosis at some point yeah i did what did they tell it was a very long one so I, I got generalized anxiety um major depressive disorder obsessive compulsive disorder and anorexia nervosa and there will be a pop quiz at the end. There will be a pop quiz. <laughs> was it yeah. validating to hear all that stuff laid out in front of you? Yeah, it was. It kind of finally felt like I wasn't just making everything up. Mm. It was actually something that was real and recognised. But more importantly, it opened up a door for education and understanding for myself and for my family. 
it allowed us to start to talk about it, well, more importantly, me to talk about it, which was everything. Talking about it, you know, just takes it out of your head. In addition to talking it out with the A team, Amy also set about redefining her relationship with exercise and her body. At first, I was pretty intensely set on continuing to exercise throughout my recovery. And then I had the realization, I need to give myself space from this because right now, exercise is fueled by fear for me. And it's fear that if I stop exercising, I'm gonna get fat, something bad's gonna happen. It was me trying to control everything still. So I kind of realized I need to step back from this and allow the relationship with my body and with exercise to come from a place of love rather than fear. And so stepping back from that, I kind of stepped more into a world eventually of yoga and meditation, which taught me a lot about mindfulness and kindness to myself and my body and listening to my body. And I, I met some really amazing people that guided me in that. Yoga in itself, I see, is like a moving meditation and it's just flowing with the present moment and where you feel you want to go with it. So it's kind of become my dancing in a way. Yeah, it's blissful presence in the moment. It's funny, the thing at the very beginning you described why you liked doing dance classes when you were a kid and you said you just enjoyed the movement. And this was before we talked about the sort of the public adulation part. You just enjoyed the movement. Mm. Is this finding a way back to that? <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that. Because when you're on a stage, you have no option but to be present. Because if you drift away for a second, then you're in trouble. In the end, Amy missed almost the entirety of year 11. But thanks to her mum, who advocated for her and arranged things with the school, she eventually returned, able to complete year 12. Did it feel triumphant? It did. And I have so much to thank for my friends at school who really welcomed me in as if I had never been gone a second. They took me to all my classes, made sure that I was never alone a second. Like I always had someone escorting me as such and acting as if I hadn't just missed a whole year. Why do you think your friends weren't to that much effort? I think they're really good people. <laughs> the, I, and they, I think they found a place where they could be of help and they really stepped up and I'm like forever so grateful for that. <laughs> I'm getting emotional. <laughs> they know who they are though. So I think after having such an intense near death experience of a year, once I got back to school, I was in a completely different headspace of like, hey, I'm just really grateful to be alive and to be here and to have friends who I can connect with and who love and support me and to be able to learn things was really cool. Um, rather than just being at home, like stuck in my obsessive thinking, it was really cool to be there. So everything, how other people thought of me, uh, gossip, like it all just faded away. I was like, that shit does not matter one bit. Like life goes so much further beyond your time at school and the people there. Amy never really did return to performing. The reinvention of Ames continued on its path and through all of these new experiences, Amy was essentially dismantled and built brand new, complete with new philosophies, a new lease on life, and this new appreciation for what really mattered to her now. Once upon a time, Amy's identity was as a performer. Mm. It was all built on that. What's your identity built on now? I focus less now on what I want to do rather than what I want to be. So I don't want to just be a kind person who's really grateful for everything that I have and continuously working to grow and connect with other people through vulnerability and just being honest about whatever I'm going through. And as for her inner critic, Amy says she's learnt how to be kinder to herself. And that involves challenging those harsh thoughts that come into her head, pitting Amy against Amy. It's about acknowledging that life ebbs and flows and so do emotions and that is okay it still goes not with as much intensity and i think it's because i don't give it fuel like i used to or i don't i observe it more rather than really buy into it respecting that that's where i'm at for that day 
but also knowing that it's not the be all and end all of who I am forever. It's just how I feel, but it's not how I am. But I'm still dealing with shit, just like everyone else is, and I love it. Like, I think it's great to be continuously working on yourself and to try to get to a better place, and I'm getting there. It's safe to say Amy is very far from being alone in this experience. Dr. Grant Blaschke is Beyond Blue's lead clinical advisor and really something that I think affects not just young people but people of all ages too. Dr. Grant, it's lovely to see you again. Great to see you again. That whole concept of having an inner critic, that's got to be quite a common thing that people probably experience but don't always like, really realise, I imagine. Absolutely. Look, all of us have got this sort of inner voice chatting away, assessing things. And the problem with people with anxiety or depression is that that inner voice, that self-talk, can get hypercritical and a bit destructive and quite annoying for people. So with my patients, we spend quite a lot of time trying to unpack what that little voice in their head is telling them. Are there particular challenges, I mean, because Amy's story takes place really when she's at school, are there particular challenges in this area for young people? Yeah, we know that 50% uh, of mental health issues begin under the age of 14, and about 75% of mental health issues start under the age of 25. That's why we put a lot of effort in Australia into helping young people. Programs like Headspace, or Beyond Blues, BU program, which is in about 60% of schools now, uh, because we know there's a lot of gains to be made in young people. One of the things that happened with Amy is that she ended up taking a while to find the right fit with a mental health professional. Is, is that quite a common thing for people? Very common. A couple of good tips. It's not always easy to find a GP or a mental health professional they can fit with. So, good idea to ask family or friends. The grapevine's very good. If you ring up a clinic, ask the receptionist, oh, is there a GP there who's quite interested in mental health issues? That's another helpful thing. And if you go along to someone, we're all different personalities and you just don't click, don't be shy to get a second opinion or move. Try and find someone that you trust, that you relate to. This is good doctor shopping. This is the kind of doctor shopping we can get behind. I hear you. Lastly, <laughs> she engaged with something called cognitive behaviour therapy, which is quite a common term. I think CBT gets used as the acronym. I'm listening. What is that? So CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, was developed by the psychologists and really it's about helping people identify common patterns of negative thinking and negative feelings and unhelpful behaviours that are contributing to their mental health issues. So it's done in quite a structured way. Often there's a worksheet and you write out some of those inner critic thoughts and actually have a look at them. Is that true? Is that fair? Is that realistic? So it's a bit different to sort of just, you know, positive affirmations. You're not walking around saying, I am well, I am lovely. It's not that. It's actually trying to get your mind into a sort of fairer, kinder space. Um, and at the same time, looking at your behaviours and, and how you could help your mental health. Out of everything that Amy said, what do you, what's your major takeaway? I thought it was quite interesting that in her case, not for everyone, she found a diagnosis, or in her case, a number of diagnoses, really very valuable for her. It sort of validated what was going on um, and meant that she could get the right help. And I think that that was an important part of her resolution and ultimately getting back to some of those situations that she really grown to fear. Dr. Graham, lovely to talk to you again. Thank you. As you've been talking, I've noticed you have a, a tattoo on your arm. No. <laughs> can you tell me, can you describe what it what it uh, looks like? Yes, yeah, so it's a hand holding a bunch of flowers, alike to that of the Gang of Youth song cover for Say Yes to Life. And it's got my brother's handwriting saying Say Yes to Life on it. It kind of serves as that reminder to me that I'm really loved um, by my family, obviously. and and to just live life boldly and to embrace the pain, embrace everything, because that's what it's all about.
just before I let you go, there is a line from that Gang of Youth song that resonated with Amy, and honestly, it's resonated with me ever since Amy told me her story. And the line is this, it's okay to not be so all right, but don't be alone. And in some ways, I think that sums up what we've tried to do over this last six episodes of this series, to show that you are not alone. And a huge thank you to Amy and everybody for coming on this show and sharing their story. If you're listening to this and you want to join the conversation and share your story, all you need to do is head along to beyondblue.org.au slash forum. If you or anyone that you know needs any kind of support, you can visit our website or call our support service on 1300 22 4636. And as always, there's a bunch of resources in the show notes. Not Alone has been a Beyond Blue podcast hosted by me, I'm Mark Fennell, produced by Sam Loy and executive produced by Darcy Sutton, Sarah Alexander and Tom Ross. It was mixed by Saskia Black and recorded by Ryan De Silva and Andy Wilson. This podcast was produced on Wurundjeri, Boon Wurrung and Gadigal country and we pay respect to the traditional owners of these lands. From all of us, thank you for listening to Not Alone.